Well, good evening, brothers and sisters. Thank you so much for joining me tonight for another BEC session on Christian cults. And today we're going to be looking at the first cult uh, of our series to the, uh, of, of our series in the BEC. We are looking at uh, the Mormon Church, or what they would like to be known as the Church of Jesus Christ of the Latter Day Saints. Let me pull up my slides, and then we will get right into it. Today, I'll be looking particularly at um, the history, origins, and the problems, yeah, uh, and the problems of the Mormon Church, and uh, from there. And next week, we'll be looking at how we can engage. How what are some uh, key passages, and well, I will be talking about some key passages later. Uh, that is uh, important for us to memorize so that we can engage with uh, the Mormon missionaries or Mormon members that we might know. Uh, and from there, we will look into, and next week we'll look into what are the developments of the Mormon church in terms of their extension and expansion, and what then should we do uh, in response and in, in response and in a continuing uh, effort to make sure that the true gospel is proclaimed in the midst of, uh, in the midst of, uh, uh, of uh, misteachings and wrongful teachings such as the Mormon Church. Yeah? Okay. The big question that I would like to highlight uh, to the Mormon community and ultimately to uh, every one of us here is the question of can we become gods? Yeah? Can we become gods? Now, in talking to the Mormons community, they would say, oh, don't capitalize G-O-D-S. Uh, they would actually mean small g, but I feel there is a, there's a distinction without a difference. Later, when I mention further about what do they mean by God, um, you will find that uh, there is a equivalency here. Lah, you know. So even for them, when they look at Elohim, he was not God from eternal past. He became God. I'll look into that a little bit more deeper. Yeah. But let's first and foremost talk about a couple of things. One is that uh, the Mormon Church would like to actually prefer to be known as the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter-day Saints. They encourage the believers to call themselves the Church of Jesus Christ, or they call themselves uh, Latter-day Saints, or they call themselves LDS. But for tonight, I'm just going to use Mormon, because when we say Mormon, it is quite permeated um, across international uh, information and culture. It is easier to say, it's easier to say Mormons rather than LDS, LDS, Latter day Saints, Latter day Saints, Church of Jesus Christ, you know, without confusing people or uh, with an additional uh, uh, a vowel, a vowel in, the, in their, in their, uh, in, in trying to name them, you know. So Mormons, yeah. The Mormon Church actually has been working very hard to be accepted into common culture today. In fact, many a time, uh, we, as much as we would look at them and be like, oh, they're Mormons. Last time, they used to be feared a lot more. This time round, I think due to their additional additional efforts to be more open and communicating to uh, to people around the world in various forms, uh, they are becoming more and more generally accepted. And they would like to be called mainstream. They would like to be looked upon as Christians, or they would like to be looked upon as true Christians, uh, However, their belief still keeps them out, out and away from orthodoxy. Now, what kind of things have they been, uh, what kind of efforts have been made? Well, first of all, they've been put as a joke and thankfully they did not like uh, react in a negative way. So there is a funny musical called The Book of Mormon. Uh, it's from the creators of South Park. If you know, you know. Uh, but The Book of Mormon is a very funny tale of a young Mormon missionary who is having a crisis of faith while he is on a mission, yeah? And it's full of music and so on and so forth. It's on Broadway. Uh, it's very funny. It, the the money, um, monies that they earn does not go back to the Mormon church. Uh, so yeah, I mean, <laughs> if you ever get a chance to watch it, by all means, go ahead and find. But what they are known for, other than their missionary efforts, which is quite rapid, is that uh, uh, the Mormon church is known to be a faith for a family. They are faith for a family. The picture that you see right here is uh, the former president candidate of uh, uh, from Utah. Uh, his name is Mitt Romney. Yeah, so Mitt Romney is the one sit. There's the lone person sitting down at the bot uh, at the bottom here. Yeah, and he was governor of Utah, and he was aspiring to be a president candidate for Utah. And then you see this is his family. 
and all of them are happy-go-lucky moments. Uh, they are, uh, and you can see that they have uh, not just become a Mormon by just their direct nuclear family. They have in, there's intermarriage, there is uh, uh, adoption. So last time, and I know this question might come up a little later, but wasn't the Mormon church racist before? Last time it was just like the Caucasian people were the perfect people and then the everyone else is, is not of the faith. Well, of course, they changed their tune. If you've seen their uh, new Mormon uh, advertising, they try to be as interracial, multiracial, and multi, uh, uh, multi-ethnicity as possible. Yeah. Bottom line is the Mormon church is looked upon as a faith for a whole family. And that is why as much as they are looked upon as a cult, they are looked upon quite respectably. People seem to appreciate them for their family values, their um, their ethics, you know, uh, their standard, their standards of morality, you know. So for them, you know, traditional uh, uh, marriage is the only way to go. Children and abundance of the Lord, and every one of them should be uh, growing up together in the faith. Yeah, and so that is one of the main efforts, and that's also one of the main draws of the Mormon Church. Many of the Mormon Church uh, church members and new members to say that when we ask, when asked about their faith, why is it that they go into the Mormon church, they will say, oh, it's because it is a faith for my whole family, you know? And on another time, if we want to talk about their liturgy, like how they do church service, um, you know, that's something that we can look at and you can see how it is uh, very much interacting among the family as a whole, yeah? So Mormonism, or formerly known, uh, formerly known as the Latter-day Saints, okay? So like I said earlier, I'm just going to say Mormon. Mormonism was founded by Joseph Smith, who claims that he was visited by Elohim and Jesus Christ. When he was 14 years old, he had a crisis of faith. And uh, the, the attestations about him was that at 14 years old, he fervently prayed uh, on, his way, on his way back home uh, in, <clears throat> in the wilderness. And after overcoming what they would claim is a death of darkness over his shoulders, he's able to muscle up his strength to call upon the name of the Lord. Then the evilness was taken away and God and Jesus Christ or Elohim and Jesus Christ came down upon him and told him that uh, he was chosen to restore the church. Yeah. Now, what does restoration mean? Restorationism basically means that these are cults or groups that believe that they are the true church and everyone else has failed. Everyone has apostate. Everyone has uh, erred in their ways and teaching. So for Joseph Smith, he, said God, he claimed that God told him that all the churches of the world is no longer uh, following true Christianity and he has chosen Joseph Smith to be the new prophet and to usher in the new Christianity. So therefore, he claims that all denominations are an abomination and he's tasked to restore true Christianity. Yeah. Now we have to understand that when he was at that time, when he was young at that time, there was already a very deep uh, division between the established church, like uh, Presbyterian, uh, Presbyterian and Anglican or Episcopal churches, to the new evangelical movement where there were street preachers and ushering people to join a new church where it's very minimalist and just talking about repentance and and following and, and falling deeply in Je to, Jesus, to Jesus Christ and to uh, fervently uh, have a new vigor for faith and to administer the ordinances like baptism and Lord's Supper. So there's this uh, ongoing struggle there. And of course, during those days, unfortunately, the denominations were dissing each other. You know, the Presbyterians were speaking bad about the Baptists, the Baptists were speaking bad about the Roman Catholic Church, Roman Catholic Church was speaking bad about, about the Anglican Church and the Episcopal Church was, was speaking bad of, uh, uh, was speaking bad of everybody. You know, so with all that tension, all that confusion, Joseph Smith would claim, uh, he says that none of these therefore are right, and therefore he claims to be bringing in true Christianity. This was his, uh, there was this was his preaching call. This was his pastoral call that he started going from community to community and started recruiting people into this new new Mormon movement, yeah, or new Latter Day Saint movement, yeah. Now, what then do they believe in? Where from? Whence do the sacred texts come from? Now. 
they have multiple sacred texts. Yeah. First, they will first let me just say that they take the Bible as the word of God. Yeah. They prefer the King James Version only because it is the same linguistic uh efforts or the same language style as the Book of Mormon. Yeah. So the Book of Mormon has not changed very much from the King from the King James English light or the Shakespearean English light. And uh, they continue, and so they would like the King James Bibles to, so that they may sound very much the same. Because the Mormon Church take the Bible and the Book of Mormon to be the to, to be uh, equal. They take the Book of Mormon to be the another testament of Jesus Christ. Now, of course, we may know the story of the Book of Mormon. Uh, Joseph Smith claimed that an angel called Moroni uh, had guided him to these uh, golden plates, which no one else has ever seen. And a pair of uh, stones that was put in uh, a pair of stones that looked like glasses, so that through the glasses he was able to translate through these gold plates and uh, and be able to uh, read out the script of the Book of Mormon, and then someone else will uh, will uh, will scribe it down. Yeah, it then came to about close to, yeah, how many hundreds of pages here? Yeah, from Moroni all the way to let's see. Yeah, over five hundred and thirty pages of uh, uh yeah, five hundred thirty pages of script. It must be said that uh, while some is claimed to be uh written through the interpretation or translation of these so called gold plates, which no one else has seen before, uh, but there many a times people have witnessed that oftentimes he will use those stones that were said to be he put them on like glasses and then he reads the the gold plates. He will use those stones, put them in a hat, put his face in the hat. And from there, he claims that he is able to continue to dictate the Book of Mormon without needing the Book of Mormon. So, how much do you want to take into that? Believe in that or not? You know, that's something to that, that's that, that's of course. Uh, I'm very much skeptical. Uh, yeah. Um, the bottom line I wanted to say about this also is that the reason why they believe in multiple sacred texts is because they believe in open revelation. Open revelation is the belief that God continues to speak out other than the Bible, you know, and I don't mean like the Holy Spirit prompts you, you know, uh, which we get all the time, but they will believe that the Holy Spirit or God will be able to speak to people beyond the Bible and what, and he is uh, able to write another book of the Bible again. So by that, so by that logical, by that, re by that reasoning, yeah, so by that reasoning, they will take the Bible, then the Book of Mormon, to be equal. And while they're at it also, they will take Doctrine and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price to be equal in sacred texts. Doctrine and Covenants, uh, well, of course, they, it self-describes. It is the Doctrine and the Covenants, so the statements of faith, particularly to the Mormon Church. And the Pearl of Great Price is the biography of Joseph Smith and his revelation of how and all the all the anointings and all the great visions that they that he claimed to have had, uh, uh in uh, in his uh, early years in starting the Mormon Church, yeah. So many of us may know about this blue color book, yeah. So this book is the Book of Mormon, and it's a blue color book. Sorry, you can't see the title here because it's a blurred vision. Uh, so normally they will pass these around for free, yeah, but. What you don't know is that many times that if you go to a church or you go deep into the faith, you end up having a three a three book a three book compilation where it would be the Book of Mormon, Doctrine and Covenant, and the and the Pearl of Great and the Pearl of Great Price, and they will refer to these things, uh, cross cross relate them almost equally in authority. So that's why I take it to them to believe in multiple sacred texts. But of course, the one challenge that the missionaries will always say is that take the Book of Mormon, read it from beginning to end, and pray to God to say, God, are you are, are you the, truly the God of the Book of Mormon? And if you and if you are, I will greatly I will follow you to the end of the days. So they will always challenge people in that way. They will say that you know, um, they will ask the question if if something other than what you believe came out to be true, would you believe that instead? And of course. We will say yeah, and of course we will say yes. If you want to be honest, honest Christians, you know, uh, honest uh, thinking people, we will say yeah. You know, um, uh, 
if I find something that's contrary to my faith or in addition to my faith to actually be true, then I will have to rethink it, you know? So they will say, do the same thing as you read through the Book of Mormon and pray that the Holy Spirit will give you faith to, to believe in what it says. Well, I can tell you personally for me, I did it when I was younger. I just found it to be ridiculous. Yeah. And God in and God in his discernment has given me, given me knowledge to say that now. Uh, this is not his revelation. Yeah. So it it's a two-edged sword in that challenge. You know, and then of course they'll call me an apostate and they will try and, and they won't they won't talk to me anymore. But uh, there we go. Yeah. As time goes by, they have now been known to be the richest cult in the world. Yeah. They are net worth a hundred billion dollars. In fact, if the if the Mormon church was regarded as uh, uh, brought as uh, mainstream Christianity, they will be in the top richest denominations in the world. Yeah. The reason is because their faith requires them to give them 10% net, uh, net from their offering to the church every year. That includes 10% from whatever companies they own. That includes 10% from uh, their, their, their income. That also includes 10% of their active and passive income. Yeah. They are, it is recorded, it is known, it is, uh, it is uh, accounted on whether you give or don't give. They're very strict about this. They're strict about other things as well, you know, but giving, they are, they are quite well coordinated. They also will look into uh, pursuit of holiness, yeah, which also, uh, which also includes things like abstinence from alcohol and from caffeine drinks. I will get into that a little later. Salvation must be earned by faith and good works. Yeah, They firmly believe that the Bible teaches that Jesus came uh, and, and, is, and, was, uh, uh, and, died for our, and died for our sins so that we may be atoned for the, for the sins of Adam. Yeah? So that we may have a fresh start and also a, a, a primary example in Jesus Christ. Yeah? But they do believe that in, to, in order to go into the celestial kingdom, there are three levels of heaven. And they will say that, the, that to, in order to get to the highest level of heaven, they need to uh, work out their faith, do good works, fulfill the covenants and ordinances of the church so that they may be sealed together with their spouse for all eternity and end up be, and, uh, uh, and, not, and therefore earn their salvation and place among the gods and in that I and in that they also claim that the ultimate goal to life is to become a god like jesus they look at jesus as a literal example meaning what jesus had done they also can do you know so when jesus died and rose again on the third day so did so will they so when they die they will raise they will rise again and when they rise they will end up becoming uh, like gods and if they were to be married in the Mormon temple, they are sealed for life and they are able to have other children, many more children to fill up an, another earth in another, in another universe, uh, in another uh, galaxy, but in an, uh, uh, around another star. Yeah. So, yeah, that's what they believe in. That's, uh, that, is what, that is one of their main foundations and their end game or their goal. Yeah. So for them, doing doing good deeds and behaving and going in the pursuit of holiness is a big deal for them because it is uh, necessary for their salvation. So let's look at Mormonism in the four big questions. The four big questions, of course, is the questions of origin, meaning, morality, destiny. Where do I come from? What does it mean to live? What is right and wrong? And, what, and where do we go when we die? Yeah. So origin, we came from God who himself was one hu once human. The Mormons believe that God, or Elo whom they call particularly Elohim, was actually human from the planet called Korah in another galaxy. Uh, Korah. That he was able to attain Godhood, came down to earth and had many, and had, uh, and have, cho and have children. Uh, and we are all, in according to, according to Mormon theology, we are all uh, children of Elohim, the offspring. Yeah? So, Elohim therefore has uh, not only he was not only Father God he is also he there's also therefore uh, Mother God or mothers but they are not highlighted simply because they are merely child bearers in order for us to in order to exist and live so they believe that they came from God and God Himself was once human like us why uh, and and to 
and to confirm what they're saying, you teach that's that's how logically it says, oh, if it if God uh if we require if Jesus showed that living from human to godhood is a way to life is a way for eternal life, that means for us as well as humans, we should earn our ways into eternal life and that will become gods like Jesus. And if Jesus was like that, therefore God was like God Elohim was like that as well. So with that, they require to live pure lives in order to achieve godhood. Now, I did mention earlier that they have to do good works for their salvation. That's why uh, they do quite a number of things militantly. Um, they don't take alcohol. Yeah, so they abstain. They also abstain from caffeinated drinks. So tea, coffee, um, soda, a majority of sodas. Uh, yeah, because why? Uh, they believe that the Caffeine is also a stimulant to the body and therefore an impurity. So they recommend do not, so they would believe that that is forbidden as it was forbidden from as early on, as early on as the, as Joseph Smith himself, but especially in the second presidency of Brigham Young. Yeah. So they need to do that in order to achieve Godhood. Moral living, morality, moral living is necessary for salvation. Yeah. Losing one's salvation is quite a big thing. Or being separated from the eternal family of God. This is their language. It's a big deal for them. Yeah, so that's why they'll make every effort, including sealing together with their wives so that they and their children may be forever in the, in the celestial kingdom together. But of course, the logic would then suggest that if the, if the husband and wife are sealed and then, have, and then they have children, and what if the children were to leave the faith? What happens to them? Then, of course, they have no choice but to say, well, sadly, they cannot enter the celestial kingdom with the family. And that adds anxiety to say, oh, you know, I don't want to let go of my kid. You know, I don't want to be separated from my kid. And that becomes even more endured uh, because of this uh, framework of thinking. Yeah, And so that's why uh, the Mormon church has a very deep-seated grasp on all of their members because not only is family, the uh, a good and faithful family is the goal in their eternal life, but it's also a sign of faithfulness, not of God, but of themselves. So what's the final destiny? If they live good lives, if they abstain from the things that they are told to abstain, if they do Mormon missionary work, you know, frequently, so it's not just young people, although majority of the young people are the ones, you know, in their first, in, when they turn 18, Two years they go into a Mormon missionary. Uh, they they go into the mission field, but they also call upon older people to be uh, missionary parents. You know, so there is a senior mission, and uh, yeah, as as long as the prophet or the quorum of the twelve apostles, which is their leadership, would tell them to go, they'll go. Yeah, uh, why? Because in the end of the day, they want to become gods like Jesus did. Yeah, there is a famous. Um, uh, uh, titular of a uh, titular of a sentence, uh, given by Lorenzo Snow. He is the LDS fifth president or the Mormon church, the fifth president of the Mormon church. He said, "As man is, God once was; as God is, man may become." See what I mean? As man is, God once was; and as God is, man may become. This so this is fundamental in their beliefs. They do believe that. The objective to for every human being is to be in the be of the celestial kingdom, or to which then they be to which then they become gods and be gods in different planets, in different galaxies, in different uh, in the different ends of the universe. Yeah. So therefore, what would their main problem be? The problem in Mormon, Mormonism would be the God and hope uh, would be about God and the hope of salvation. This is an extraction from uh, their Doctrines and Covenants. Doctrines and Covenants, number 132, verses 19, 20, and 21. Yeah, uh, it's, it's important to read through this whole thing because uh, it really does speak a lot. The main crust or the main cornerstone of the Mormon faith. Yeah, this is the context of uh, Doctrines and Covenants 132 is about marriage and marriage sealing, yeah, which is a very unique. Uh, a unique uh, ceremony of the Mormon church. Yeah, It says, And again, verily I say unto you, 
If a man marry a wife by my word, which is my law, and by the new and everlasting covenant, so if they if they marry the, the way that Joseph Smith had commanded, uh, and they make an everlasting covenant, and it is sealed unto them by the Holy Spirit of promise, by him who is anointed, unto whom I have appointed this power and the keys of, the, of this priesthood. So if it's done by the prophet or done properly in the temple, and it shall be unto them, ye shall come forth in the first resurrection. So ye shall come forth in the first resurrection. So that means the husband and wife will come up together. And if it be after the first resurrection, in the next resurrection, and shall inherit thrones, kingdoms, principalities, and powers, dominions, all heights and depths. Yeah. So that means uh, if not one resurrection, so they that this is uh an implicit mention of different levels of heaven. They hope to go to the celestial kingdom, the highest level of heaven in the first resurrection. But if they end up in the second level, which is normally called the telestial kingdom, they will say, never mind, then they can die there and then they will come back up in the next resurrection and then they shall inherit thrones, kingdoms, principalities and powers and dominions, all heights and depths. Now, dominion, authority, kingdoms, how can you inherit kingdoms and principalities when God is the king of all kings and the king of all kingdoms? So they take the idea that, okay, if he's a king, if God is the king of kings, then the husband and wife shall be kings in different kingdoms. Just And if it's the same as just as God, God is, then he, they will be gods in a different galaxy. Yeah. Then shall it be written in the Lamb's book of life, so they are sealed in their salvation, that he shall commit no murder whereby he to shed innocent blood. And if ye abide in my covenant and commit to no and commit no murder whereby to shed innocent blood, so you shall not kill, it shall be done unto them in all things whatsoever my servant hath put upon them in time and through all eternity, and shall be of full force when they are out of the world, and they shall pass by the angels and the gods which are set there to their exaltation and glory in all things. So that already there are other humans who became gods already. Yeah? As have been sealed upon their heads, which glory shall be a fullness and a continuation of the seeds forever and ever. So that means not only will they go into heaven, they will co have a continuation of the seeds, meaning they will have children in the celestial kingdom. You know, and then send them down onto earth to go through human life so that they may rise and not to become uh, children of gods, children of gods or gods as well. Hence, the next phrase here, then they shall be gods because they have no end. Now, this is where they say, yeah, you see, Mark, you shouldn't have put capital G, it's only small g. And therefore, they will, they will say, yeah, you know, Elohim is distinctly different, functionally different because he is our heavenly father and we can never be above him. But to say that the Heavenly Father is a burden just because he gave birth to us, it's like saying that, oh, my, my father is higher than me, be, uh, higher than me uh, because he is my father. But that doesn't make him any more human or more divine than me. And I'm not less human because he is my father. Yeah. So that is a false equivocation. That's a faulty logic there. Yeah. So if we can be like God, the Heavenly Father, through the works and the example of Jesus Christ, then it falls the logical reason that we shall be like gods, just as Jesus is God already. Then they shall form everlasting, everlasting, because they continue. Then they shall be above all, because all things are subject unto them. Then, then shall they be gods, because they have call power, and the angels are subject unto them. The angels are subject unto them. The angels are the servants of the, of the one true God. And yet for them, the angels are the servants of gods. Very, very, I say unto you, except ye abide my law, ye cannot attain to this glory. So if you don't believe this, if you don't pursue this, you will never attain this glory. You will never be saved. Yeah, And this is just from one part of one of the hundred and over a hundred over uh, doctrine and covenants. Yeah. And already it says very clearly that their goal is to be gods and to work for their own salvation. Because in them, their opinion, Jesus gave a good example. He was sufficient for the initial salvation, you know, 
uh, he was able to atone for Adam, Adam's sin, but for us, is for us, he for us, we are not, and it is our responsibility to work it out. And if we do it well, not only will we be saved children of God in his kingdom, but we end up can be can become gods like him and uh and be able to rule in another kingdom, in another planet, in another galaxy. Now, what are some Bible verses for us to counter this idea? You know, what are some clear Bible verses to show who God is, how he is connected in Jesus, through Jesus Christ as the second person of the Trinity, and how Jesus himself is sufficient for eternal salvation, and that there's no one level of heaven, but no three levels of heaven, but only one level of heaven. Yeah, well, this is where we should memorize some Bible verses. One of them is John 11, verses 25 to 26. Uh, this is the encounter of Jesus and Martha at the death of Lazarus, or at the tomb of Lazarus. You know, Jesus said unto her, Jesus said unto Martha, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet, yet shall he live. And whosoever liveth and believeth in me shall never die. Believest thou this? You know, so Jesus already put upon himself to be the final destination and the ultimate penalty and ultimate payment for our sins. He says, I am the resurrection and the life. I'm not the first resurrection. I am not the example resurrection. I am the resurrection and the life. And if you believe in me, though you will die, you will live. So just by believing in him, we shall live just as he lives. And as he lives, is straight into the celestial kingdom in their heads. But to us, it's in heaven. It is with him. And it's only by him and through him. You know, and whoever believe, lives and believes in me shall never die. So therefore, our belief, in, our belief in Jesus makes us to never die. And we will end up, and even our, and if our body will, we were to separate ourselves from our physical body, we will end up being in the safe, in the safe space of God. Now the question is, do you believe this? Notice there's no mention of you need to do covenants, you need to do beliefs, you need to do all these things. You don't see that in the Bible, especially in the New Testament. You know, all we need, therefore, is to believe. So John eleven twenty five to twenty six is a very key verse for us to contemplate and remember when we want to when we want to have that discussion with the Mormon with, with the Mormon missionaries or with any Mormon. Ephesians two also says very clearly, yeah, for by grace are ye saved through faith, and not and that not of yourselves; it is the gift of God, uh, gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God hath for, before ordained that we should walk in them. Yeah? Let's break it down. It is only by grace are we saved through faith, and that not of yourselves, it is the gift of God. Which is that? Grace. And because faith, and because we are saved through faith, by grace, these two are contingent to one another. And therefore, both effectively our gift from God. God gives us the grace that we may be saved through faith. And faith, therefore, is the manifestation of the Holy Spirit in our lives, and to which then we know that we are His workmanship. Not of works, lest any man should boast. We are His workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works. So we are created to do good works, but not for salvation, but because we are saved. Because in Christ Jesus, only then we can do good works. Not because of Christ, not because of Christ Jesus, we can do works, good works like Him. And it's not that true. And it's not that we do like Jesus, then we had the same result like Jesus. And if we fail, we might lose it. No, no, no. It's because Christ Jesus has done it for us. That's why we can be called God's workmanship. And all this God had before ordained so that we should walk in them. God had ordained yeah, God had ordained this grace work through faith so that we should walk in them. Not for them, walk in them. So Ephesians 2, 8 to 10 and John 11, 25, 26 are important verses to remember. You know, so that when people talk about this other way of thinking about salvation and living after death, uh, uh, yeah, we can then see no. Jesus Christ is the sufficient Savior. 
and his work on the cross is, is sufficient for all eternity. There is no celestial kingdom, terrestrial kingdom. There's only one kingdom, and that is his. Yeah? And God, and it's, and it's with him that we shall be with as long as we have faith in him, which is a grace, give, gracious gift of God. Yeah? Side topic, you know, and I'll bring it up also next week, is that, uh, you know, when they challenge about the Book of Mormon, you see, now they think that the Book of Mormon is an infallible re revelation through Joseph Smith. But uh, in the history of in the history of the Mormon of the Book of Mormon, uh, even the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints also but also you know formally declared that over the past hundred seventy years, sorry, over the past hundred and seventy eight years, seven major editions of the Book of Mormon had been published by the Church of Jesus Christ of Latter Day Saints. Okay, the purpose of each new edition is to eliminate the human errors that have occurred. So if so, that means uh, your the, their prophet did not record it correctly, and when they edit it, they had to re-edit it, and they did not edit. And by the way, they don't have original copies. They don't have early manuscripts. They don't have Joseph Smith's version, you know. And in fact, they edit from Joseph Smith's version. So that means, in their open revelation, they can edit the Word of God, or at least for them, they can edit the Book of Mormon. Now, in the in this website, in the website page that they that they put up. They will say that, oh, no, it's just grammar, small things, not detrimental to faith and salvation. But there are a couple of things which are very, very different, which would then change the way we view, they, we view the theology as a whole. One of those things I've alluded to is, um, uh, well, a few things I mentioned. One is, of course, polygamy. Um, the fundamental LDS community believe that, com that polygamy continues. It was practiced by the second president, Brigham Young. But uh, according to them, it was in either the fifth or sixth presidency, Lorenzo Snow, who said that, yeah, you know, polygamy is a no-go anymore. Yeah. The fifth president, Lorenzo Snow, was, was actually quite racist, who then said that black people were uh, had the mark, uh, uh, are black because they possess the mark uh, of, uh, of distrust between God uh, uh, with God during the great battle between the devil and Elohim, you know. So I mean, they they take that as the mark of Cain, and therefore they were never invited into their form of salvation. You know, only recently when they changed, then they started to have a wholesome, broader display of you know the Mormon Church is Asian, African American, Spanish, Latina, Latino. You know, so yeah, uh, but that is a recent development. So then the question is, uh, if the origins can have error, how can we then say that the Book of Mormon is equivocated to the Word of God? So that's a lot of information right now. Uh, uh, at the meantime. So just, uh, it's important to realize that uh, the origins of, uh, of uh, Mormonism is very suspicious. You know, uh, the management and governance of Mormonism is very close-knit and very tightly controlled. Yeah, and that's quite and that's quite tough. And most importantly, their perception of who God is, who was once human, and Jesus Christ, who was also once human. Therefore, show therefore to them they believe that uh, uh, is not. Uh, therefore, they were never eternally God, and just as many people, many of humans like Elohim and Jesus can be can attain Godhood. You have the op we had the opportunity to, according to them, and they also then will admit that many of them will fail. That's why there's the first or the next resurrection. Yeah. So yeah, a lot to unpack, but in the end of the day, the root of it is they have a misconception of God. They have an open revelation other than the Bible. And uh and they have uh, uh yeah, uh, and they have a very a limited view of Jesus Christ, Jesus not not being the uh, the perfect atonement for all for all of our sins, and be able to and and be able to have eternal life as we believe in Him, but He was merely a good example for us to follow. So there's an insufficiency there. So something for us to think about. But I will stop here so that we may be open for questions and answers. Um. Looking forward to take your questions, especially with my with the panel. Uh, and yeah, 
thank you so much for the time. We will continue next week to look at the details and how we can progress and how we can engage and how to better better protect ourselves when the Mormon when the Mormon Church is comes knocking at your doorstep or comes speaking to you or the young people. Yeah. So thank you very much. Uh, I will pass the time back to uh yeah, pass the time back uh, to the president so that we may continue into the Q and A. Yes. Yes. All righty. Okay. Uh, we have a couple of uh, a couple of questions here. Um, okay. The first one is: Is there any references of the angel Moroni in the Bible? The answer is yes. There is a there is a chapter uh, in the Book of Mormon called Moroni, and uh, it talks about <clears throat> the final battles which led uh, which to them led the 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 tribes of the the Ju the Judaic tribes to be all, to be wiped out in the Americas, and then Moroni. In the last page, re recorded him hiding the plates of gold of the Book of Mormon in a in a place in New York. So yeah, that is uh, in so the Bible. Is... I think it's talking about the Bible. Oh, uh, sorry. Uh, oh, in the Bible, uh, absolutely none. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah, none. Uh, but they 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 think they seem to think that it's from Revelation fourteen six la, But I I don't think it's relevant la, You know, Revelation fourteen six says. Then I saw another angel flying overhead with an eternal gospel to proclaim to those who dwell on earth, to every nation and tribe. And I, I, uh, you know, it's, yeah. it's, it's a far cry from, from uh, I mean, this, this thing. Like, you know, so this, yes. it, it, they try to infer it's here, but it's definitely not. Like, definitely not. Mm. Yeah. This is not the angel Moroni yeah. uh, in and the you Bible. Can, yeah. And you can test... Uh, using that verse alone, whether Moroni is the actual angel they are referring to. Because Moroni didn't go to every nation. Moroni, yeah. uh, Moroni didn't, uh, uh, didn't bring out an eternal gospel. Okay. Uh, he didn't bring the eternal gospel because Jesus himself brought the gospel into, into America. So if, even if their, their claim about Jesus coming into, uh, uh, going into the Inca community uh, at that time is true or not. No, uh, yeah, so it, it wasn't Morana, it was Jesus himself. So yeah, uh, there's a lot of inconsistencies from, from part one. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <clears throat> absolutely. Okay, how would Mormons reconcile the verses of the ordinances and doctrine with the Bible verses that we mentioned earlier? If not, does it mean that ordinances and doctrine can supersede the Bible verses on resurrection and salvation? Okay. Uh, <laughs> I, okay. I need to I need to mention that the uh, the Mormon doctrine has changed quite dramatically over the years in order to sound more mainstream. Yeah. So, but when these doctrines and covenances were were written, uh, um, it was written with the assumption that doctrines and covenants can actually supersede the Bible because they believe in the concept of open revelation. Yeah, so that's one. Secondly, their claim is that the uh, um, belief in Jesus Christ alone will get you saved. But it won't get you saved into the celestial kingdom. It will at best put you in a terrestrial kingdom, which is a kingdom where there is no sin of Adam, but you can still, but you are in that realm, you still need to do good deeds in order to die. And you can die in this terrestrial kingdom to eventually go up to the celestial kingdom and then do that all over again to go finally into the celestial kingdom. So they don't, so the way they use the word salvation uh, is basically an entry point towards the lowest level of heaven. Uh, but that doesn't sound like heaven in any stretch of the imagination or even in the Bible, especially in the Bible. Yeah. So you have to, so this is one of the trickiest things about the Mormon community. They will use words that is very familiar to us, but they do not mean the same thing. Not mm. at all. So, John 11, 25, 26, and especially John 3, 16, uh, so, that whoever, so that 
whoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. Uh. That part there shall have everlasting life is the indication of a single destination. Not merely final destination, but single destination for all those who believe in him, which in their category is only the celestial kingdom because only in the celestial kingdom can they actually have eternal life. So salvation to them is only an entry point to holiness and entry point to perhaps go into the other parts of heaven. Uh, but that's not in line with, uh, with, uh, with, Christi with uh, true Christian teaching. Yeah, so Moroni is inferred in Revelation 14 verse 6, but the inference is uh, speculative at best. In fact, I don't think it I don't think I don't think Moroni qualifies even the mm. verse in Revelation 14 6. Yeah. I think this Revelation 14 6 to me is uh, at the last days mm. when the gospel should have been preached to all nations. Mm. Then Christ will come. So human beings are not perfect. We are lazy. In fact, mm. a lot of evangelists and missionaries prefer to go to the more developed countries, even among the 10, 40 window countries. So mm. leaving a lot of uh, these tribal people, maybe a few thousand groups of them are still mm. without a Bible. And there's no... no uh, effective witness among them. Oh. So at the end of the day, I don't think human slackness will hold back uh, Jesus' second coming. He has mm. his own timetable. So we cannot uh, try to delay the coming of Jesus by refusing to, to, to spread the gospel to every nation under the Great Commission. So at the end of the day, when we have not been able to finish the task, then this angel that is mentioned here in Revelation 14 6 will be blowing, I'm sure, is the trumpet of good news so that mm. every, everybody would have a chance to listen to the gospel and respond. Mm. And then Jesus will come again. It has nothing oh. to do with the moral night. Yeah, yeah, oh, definitely. No. But, mm. oh, but on that note, uh, I should mention that um, uh, it is by, it is by, it is by, uh, the way Tony mentions the angel in, in all of that picturing, it is that picturing that they then give the excuse that the Mormon church is the is the co is the cooperative to, to Moronized vision in uh, Moronized vision. That's why in most of the Mormon temples around the world, on top of the Mormon temple is the angel Moroni blowing a trumpet. Uh -huh. Yeah, so they are in. So they are trying really hard to push this vision that Moroni is the angel in Revelation forty six, the one that will blow the trumpet to usher in the kingdom of God, the one that will bring the gospel to the other side of the world, uh, or to, to or in the King James, I will preach unto them that dwell on the earth and um, and to every nation and kindred and tongue and people. So that's how they're trying to picture it, lah. But uh, mm. uh, uh, the 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 picturing is uh, obscure at best, um, inferred, but not proven. Yeah. The angel in uh, Revelation 14, 6 uh, is not named in the yeah. Bible. Yeah, they yeah. Get, yeah. How do they name him as a uh, Moroni? Moroni. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> so Moroni then, uh, so Moroni then reveals himself to Joseph Smith, you know, to say that I will show you the Book of Mormon. Okay, but here's the other thing. Uh, here's the only, here's the other thing that uh, I do not understand, and I don't think they have an answer to. Okay, angels come from angel comes from angelic origins, you know. But Moroni was a human being, mm. you know. So how can Moroni a human being uh, if their theology is correct? He should therefore go into the celestial or at least celestial kingdom and be like gods already, you know. But he then comes down and introduces himself as the angel Moroni. So what is this um, uh, uh, metamorphosis going on here? Because uh, 
even in their doctrine and covenants, uh, angels is a separate, uh, the, uh, the, yeah, is a separate uh, entity or separate being altogether that humans, uh, that the humans cannot become. So there's an inconsistency there also. I, I think it's equally inconsistent when to in their belief. Men can become uh, God, God, and become man. So, so they, they are equally confused in that as well. Yeah. Oh yes. Oh yes. Definitely. Yeah, yeah. Maybe, uh, Pastor Mark, I think in this respect, uh, mm. you see, number one, if you are talking about how fervent they are, the Mononites are more fervent than Christian. Number one. Oh, very much so. Yes. Talking in terms of. Uh, uh, well, and a uh, possession, the Mononite at uh, the Mormon church is much richer than us. Oh, yes, uh, they, they are much, much more richer. They have a lot of resources. You see, mm -hmm. the question right now we need to know is how can a Mormon convince someone to believe what they teach us? You see, and I think that is that's very important. What is the attractiveness uh, in this cult that attract people? You know, if uh, some Christian also turn more Mormon, you know. You see, because mm. you see, I I I visited the the island of Tonga some years ago, and you know Tonga is ninety eight percent of uh, of the island population are all Christian ninety eight percent, but when the Mormon church went in, a lot of the Christian became Mormon, and the Mormon church is very strong in Tonga now. Is it because they had the money? So the mm. question right now is, what is so attractive about this teaching that people will are being swear over to 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 I mean follow that kind of wrong teaching, which we know is definitely false teaching, is it? Mm. I can give some. I can give three three um three perspectives on that love. The first one is that the first one is that Mormons or any other culture, at the tip of their fingers, with the answers to everything. You know, you don't you don't need to, uh, and and the way they answer is almost as is it, almost as if, uh, oh yeah, you know, I've I I've known this question all along and I have a definitive answer, a definitive answer to everything, and so whereas we Christians, whereas we Christians or the evangelical faith, uh, we tend to, uh, not to say I don't know, but they will say, but well, we end up giving like a variety of options, which then end up sounding like we don't have the, we don't have the answer at all, you know. So one example is historically speaking, like with regard, regards to the Mormon Church, uh, um, Joseph Smith himself was looking at the arguments between the various denominations in New York at that time. You know, Presbyterians and Reformed Church and uh, Episcopal churches were fighting with each other, were fighting with each other all the time on what is true, what is not true. You know, and uh, therefore he says, you know, I'm going to give my answers, and this is and this is how it shall be, lah. Like. You know, so that kind of exertion is 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 attractive, especially to young people who are looking for definitive answers to life. That's one. Number two is that you will find you will find all of their all of their churches as or at least their churches are because non believers cannot go into the temple. Uh, but even in the temple, but at least the church, uh, all of all of their their house is the house is in order. So going into the church, uh, the there's not one furniture out of place. There's not one. So the facilities is very well taken care of. The uh the the ushers and everyone are very well trained and regimented. So that when people come in, uh, you uh, you basically do not even need to lift a finger to do anything. Everything goes smoothly and everything is very comfortable. Yeah. So for example, uh, I I've seen pictures of churches throughout Malaysia. Thailand and Singapore in preparation for this talk. Uh, and inside all the churches, uh, all the chairs are the same. All the doors are the same. All the pictures are the same. The air conditioning, air conditioning system is also the same. Everything is very uniform and it looks very prim and proper. Nothing is out of place. And so that attracts people to say, wow, this is a very, this is a very well-formed and well-regimented religion. So whatever you teach me, I will learn. Lah. And finally, just as what I mentioned earlier, the first thing I said, uh, Mormon church is, the, is, uh, is now, they're trying to market themselves to say that they are the faith of the family. Yeah. So they so theologically speaking, family is centered uh, in, their, uh, in their existential experience with God. 
That's why in the temple, the biggest room uh, is the sealing ceremony where where a husband and wife is sealed for eternity so that when they die and go into the celestial kingdom, they will they will produce many children, many offspring that will end up being humans in another world. You know, so that's their theology. So with that comes the draw to say, oh, this is the faith for every believer. Every person has a role and a place to play and they meet together as a family. Family values, family care, family-oriented, family-centered. Yeah. And that especially I find to be, uh, I found out to be most attractive, especially to Southeast Asian uh, uh, culture, which they also, we also believe that family is, is, a, is a center institution. Yeah, can I sort of uh, sort of uh, share a bit of comment uh, regarding uh, Josh uh, com Josh comment you know in, uh, why why people are attracted to 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 uh, Mormonism okay and uh, as I was mentioning earlier before we started uh, about eight years ago uh, I had the opportunity yeah uh, to uh, uh, to fly into Salt Lake City in Utah. And my whole family at that time uh, went uh, boarding graduated uh, from uh, this uh, Wharton. So the whole family together with Cindy, the five of us, we went to this uh, uh, Yellowstone and we flew into uh, Salt Lake City, the capital of Utah, and then rented a car to go to the, what they call that, this uh, national park, the Yellowstone, which some of you may, may know what happened there. And uh, so for, for me and for most of our family members, uh, first time uh, going into Utah and knowing that it is where the, the Mormons are, the, are prevalent is uh, is quite an attraction. So my impression you now from somebody who first time sort of uh, uh, visited that place, even very briefly. And uh, first thing, the, the place is very clean. Uh, yes. It's very clean. And then... Uh, uh, we went to the museum. We also went into like the, the place of worship, the temple. And uh, generally, uh, the people there are very friendly. The, the impression of uh, the family oriented, what call it? They are very family oriented. And uh, uh, I know of that uh, they, are, they, are, they are very happy people. So while we were having uh, 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 a dinner, you know, I was uh, looking at the other table where uh, there are young people, I think about maybe around eight or 10 people. And uh, I were to, to observe how they behave and interact. I can see that the face expression is like full of joy, you know, so happy, you know, very happy or no. And uh, that sort of, uh, uh, as an outsider, you know, attracted even Christian also, we, we don't really have so called that the happiness uh, in their voice and they always laugh, always laughing, you know, their face is so, so happy, you know. Uh, so uh, you, you see them, uh, you also want to belong to this uh, community where they're happy, you know, they're happy people, right? They live a very upright life uh, and uh, uh, alcohol is uh, is licensed, you know, it, it cannot uh, uh, consume alcohol in public places, it's only in oh. certain places. So, so it's a it's a clean place. Apparently, it's a quite an attractive place. And uh, yeah. during the, uh, uh, the what they call that this uh, pandemic, uh, the uh, unemployment in uh, in the rest of US is six over percent. Uh, the unemployment in the what they call that this uh, uh, Utah is only about two over percent, less than three percent. Yeah, there's a lot a lot of job and everything. And then there's a lot of uh, natural park. They find natural park there and. <laughs> So it's a good place uh, to uh, what I call that to, to bring up family and uh, yeah so that's why I, I say that I'm not too surprised that uh, people can be attracted. There are 16 million so-called members in worldwide, you know. Yeah, 16 million. Yeah. Okay, that's my impression. Yeah. Yeah. Th thanks for that. You were able to go into a temple open house. Uh? But I, I went there. I I. Uh, that that was a Sunday. A lot of people went to church. All of them yeah. very well dressed with suit and tie. Yes. With the family, yes. you know, it's so sort of went to wholesome, the uh, very wholesome sort of uh, okay. Uh, the, the sort of uh, the impression that I can get lah. Yeah. Oh, you went to the chapel church lah. Yeah, we went. We went there, but we didn't go. Okay. In, a lot of people coming out. I'm not sure whether you were going. Oh. They accept me or not. 
Oh yeah, yeah. If you go into a church, you can. You are you are welcome. There, there, there is a Mormon church in in PJ Newtown. There's a Mormon church in Section Fifty One Industrial yeah. Area. Anyone can go in. One ten o'clock is the service. You know, I don't even know why I'm marketing it here, <laughs> I'm just saying that it, that one you can go in, uh, Mormon temples absolutely cannot. Uh, that is yeah. uh. There's that's to them is the sacred space where they do particular covenants and ordinances. Okay, okay. I, I know uh, there, yeah. there's a church, yeah. a temple also. Uh, yeah, no. uh, uh, yeah, it's a complex, yeah. Uh, complex. Yes. Yeah. yeah, but just so you know, um, the the new the newly minted Mormon temple in Bangkok, Thailand, uh, they are having an open house now until September sixteen. You know, uh, so where you can see everything. Uh, but they also, but the interesting thing about the Mormon church is that finally, after so many years, uh, they are finally unveiling and showing all these things. Otherwise, they look upon as so secretive. Uh, naturally, they look like a cult. But now, as uh, they are coming into mainstream culture, uh, it's becoming, they are becoming a, a lot more um, daring to say that, oh, they, we are Christians. In fact, we are the true Christians. But it's not quite possible because if you add uh, more books uh, to other than Bible, that would be very difficult for you to turn back because uh, they mean you are actually adding, according to Revelation uh, chapter 22, 18 to 19, that, that will be condemned. You'll be accursed by God. You know you cannot simply add things or minus away. You see? All right. It's very, very unlike Church of Christ. Uh, Church of Christ at one point, they were actually, they, their theology is straight. You see? But the, today, the Church of Christ theology are okay. You know, I mean, they, they actually come back to the mainstream, is it? So, but mm -hmm. for more, more, maybe a bit difficult because of the additional books. Uh. Yes. Well, okay. So, we need to, so we in the evangelical community also need to get our house in order, lah, you know? So, one example is, uh, there are some churches uh, that still say that they're, they're in God's word, that in God's word, uh, uh, there is the Logos and the Rema. And so the Bible is a logos, but whatever the pastor says or pastor says is prophetic, and therefore it is the rema. You know, so when you get this kind of teaching, uh, then it opens up, it it opens a jar for all these other things to happen. Now they will not. Now they themselves will not say that the Book of Mormon replaces or adds to the Bible, but they say it is another testament of Jesus. You know, so they will so. Just as how like Seven Day Adventist takes the takes the prophecies of what's the what what is her what is the female prophet's name? E, e, Elise Elise Ellie what uh? uh Ellie. Hmm, let me see. Uh, uh Ellen yeah uh, Ellen White, Ellen G White, yeah so. Just as uh, they will say, oh, the, the prophecies of Ellen G. White is documented and recorded, uh, but uh, it is not as authoritative as the Bible, but they take the Book of Mormon to be true. But you, but do you, but do you, but I think all of us here can end up seeing the logical, the logical conclusion to that lie, you know? If the Book of Mormon is a record of of Jesus, uh, of another testament of Jesus, and if the Book of Mormon is claimed to be speaking the truth of God's work in intervention, and if the Book of Mormon actually has actually has uh, ramifications to faith, uh, then the Book of Mormon is therefore treated as like the Bible, like the Word of God. So that becomes the that, that becomes the problem. But you see how it sneakily is then added into it, lah. You know. And they will also uh, compare compare themselves to like, the Roman Catholic Church. So the Book of Mormon, so the, the Mormon Church has the Book of Mormon, they have the Doctrines and Covenants and the Pearl of Great Price. Yeah. And they will say, oh, we take the other three books to be no different, like how the Roman Catholic Church takes canon law. Right? Canon law is uh, our practices of the Roman Catholic Church, and it's strictly adhered to. Like for example, how the how the mass is being done in every in any Roman Catholic church around the world, it's all recorded in canon law, or enforced in canon law. Now, is it the word of God? The Roman Catholics say no, right? But it, is it something that we have to obey? Yes, they will have to obey. 
same thing they will take, they'll, they'll say about the Book of Mormon. So bottom line is uh, we we as the evangelical faith uh, must keep must keep our house in order to make sure that we truly display a faith that is sola scriptura, hmm. only scripture. You know? inciting inciting Martin Luther, uh, uh, unless uh, unless I am persuaded by scripture by scripture and pure and pure reason, I can do no other. Pastor Mark, you, you finish or you wanted to say something? No, huh? I, I'm, I'm done, yes. Okay, well, I just right. uh, because you mentioned just now about Seventh-day Adventists. So somehow the Seventh-day Adventists uh, is not perceived so much as a cult, right? although of Ellen White's, uh, you know, a revelation and all this kind of thing. But somehow they are not quite viewed as a cult like uh, Mormons, you know. So uh, what's your perspective on this? Yeah. Okay, so historic, okay, so we are, uh, healthy digression, uh, so seven. Yeah. Okay, so <laughs> because seven you mentioned day, it, <laughs> yes, yes, okay. yes, yes, yes. Seven day Adventists and church and churches of and churches of Christ, uh, um, has visibly over the years, ever since the nineteen sixties and seventies, uh, have undergone reformation within their denominations or within their or with or within their sects. Uh, I will call I will call them sects because they because their affirmation of 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 uh, orthodox faith, uh, is still not very it's not very hard, uh, set in stone lah. Huh? So Seven Day Adventists uh used to uh, used to take the the teaching. Oh, okay. Um, seven. It starts with a couple of things. Huh? Number one is Seven Day Adventists and Churches of Christ used to be like the Mormon Church to be Restorationist Church. Once you are Restorationist Church, uh, you are claiming that every other church is false. So when you do that, of course, it's going to that that automatic categorizes them as a cult because they are already saying everyone else is is wrong by their special revelation. But now the churches of Christ, the Seventh Day Adventists, are trying to come into the Christian community by saying, "Oh, we are Christians," you know. Then we ask them, "Okay, can you prove how you are a Christian?" And then they share their their articles and doctrines of faith. To which then we feedback to them, say, okay, we need to prove that by scripture. Otherwise, we will still posit the evangelical faith to be true because it is supported by scripture. Yeah. So the so churches of Christ, for example, had taken down the walls of being called Restorationist Church, but they are still holding to uh their one primary doctrine, and that is they you must be baptized in order to be saved, and you must be baptized in the name of Jesus, not in the Trinity. So that's one thing. The Seventh Day Adventists, um, they they baptize in they they baptize in the name of the Father, Son, and the Holy Spirit, so triune. Uh, they let me see, but they say it's not necessary for salvation, but they say true Christians, uh, a true Christian worship is also, is still keeping the Sabbath, so no work is done on Saturday. Uh, in fact, many of them, you know, practice vegetarian uh, vegetarian. Uh, a diet like Daniel on Saturdays, uh, just because it's their culture, and on Sunday, and then Sunday is uh, Sunday regular worship. Yeah. So they are still, they are still. Um, uh, so they are still what we what I would say is a sect on formation, lah, because because there are still some some SDAs, especially in the United States and some parts of Sabah that they would still say that they are the true church. Every other church is false. But is that the teaching of the Mormon church themselves that, uh, you know, that they are the, the, the what we call the restoration? Restoration, yes. Church. Yes, from Joseph Smith. Because because if you look at their, uh, we call the, the, the development of the, uh, the or rather the, 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 of the denomination, over time, they keep changing. Is it from polygamy now they become monogamous? I mean, so yes. it's it's so they, there is a slight you know changing as they mm. as time pass by. Is it? They mean they mm. are still evolving. You know, were they a day a day may come that they they are not not much different from us? Then they probably would say that look, doctrinally I'm same as you, but in terms of practice and uh liturgy. 
I am a bit different from you. And that we can't dispute, no longer dispute it anymore that they are a cult and not a, 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 a denomination. Yeah, but well, the basic basic tenets of Christian, I mean, evangelical Christian, like Trinity is very clear. So Mormon is, you know, not Trinitarian at all. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So therefore, and, one basic one basic thing, fundamental yeah. difference already. The doctrine, yeah. the and, is, uh, and that and that God and that God is actually the eternal creator, uncreated creator of the universe. Uh, Mormon Church, no. Elohim or the or the Heavenly Father was once human in another planet that then became God and then became ruler over the earth, the uh, uh, earth and uh, and the galaxy thereof. You know, so they, so they are very, very far away. Far, sound, far away. Sound like a so, science fiction. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So the big question and, is who who started it all? Joseph Smith started it. It's not oh. Elohim. Elohim came from oh. But who created Elohim? It must be Correct. somebody else, isn't it? Yes, yes. So, so the definition... The God. Yeah. Mm. yeah, so we have to go back to the God, the creator of all. Mm. So if Elohim himself was created, then we ask, who created him? Yeah. Who was who he the offspring of? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, so who created God? Some people say. So there was one who, who started it all. He's God. The, the others are not God. A very uh, pragmatic question came in from Gyokbin saying, don't you think these are all man-made rules and then and therefore, and therefore implicitly we're not, we are making arguments out of nothing? Well, you see, that's the difference between rules and doctrine, right? Rules we can change on, you know? Rules we can change, rule, uh, as long as we can reason out in scripture, sure, no problem, you know? Uh, but when we talk about doctrine, Doctrine, uh, doctrine is not necessarily prescriptions. They are description and therefore must, must be rooted in truth. Yeah. So if it is rooted in truth, there is a right and there is a wrong. Yeah. And I'm sad to say that the Mormon church, no matter how nice it looks and no matter how, how well they keep their rules, keep their pace clean and, and keep sweet, uh, 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 what is the, the LDS term? Uh, uh, keep sweet and obey. Yeah, they keep sweet and obey all the rules and covenants of their of their faith, uh, but their doctrine fundamentally is is false, is wrong, yeah. and therefore they will end up being worshiping and adhering to a false god, and that is what is that is what we cannot abide. The other thing concerns the different levels of heaven. Yep. Yeah, celestial heaven and other and celestial terrestrial uh, kingdom and also yeah mm. but in the in our Christian doctrine there is only one heaven you know? yep. so we we of course there are you know other heavens described as the atmosphere the first heaven second heaven would be you know the outer space third heaven would be where God dwells with his family host right now you know? mm. but Eventually, there is only one place, the new heaven and the new earth, and God will be our God, <laughs> and we are his people. There's no mm. three different levels, you know. Mm. And then Jesus pointed it out very clearly in John 17, 3. John 17, 3. Is it? And this is eternal life, life. that you know uh, God, that they may know you, the one, you the, one, the, one, the one true God, and Jesus Christ, whom he has sent. Yes. That is all about eternal life, you know. We, we are going to have a relationship with an eternal mm -hmm. being forever and ever. And that is heaven, you know, knowing him. Even it begins at a point of salvation. So there's no, no different levels of heaven for us. You know, some will be living at a top, you know, 1,000 story high, and there's a penthouse. And some mm. don't do so well be at the basement. I don't think there's <laughs> such <laughs> such division, you know, in heaven. If oh, you have a relationship, yes, you are in, you know. If not, yes. And the other thing that they also are uh, they they are marketed very differently from what scripture explicitly says uh, is mm. the this eternal ceiling of husband and wife. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Meaning they are married beyond death. 
They're married forever yeah. in that case. Yeah, forever. Yeah, they're married beyond that. What, what if they don't get along well on earth? Then they're stuck <laughs> forever. There, there's no more heaven. It's heaven. It's hell for them. Well, okay. So the uh yeah, so that's so so that's why for them are uh, keep, keeping sweet and obey. And that's why there's always a very top-down hierarchical hierarchical uh way of living, la, you know, and very clearly the wife is submissive to the husband. Must. Otherwise, everything falls to pieces. Right? So, but now I, I digress. So now those are rules, you know. Can we change rules? Definitely. You know, are there some rules that the Mormon church are practicing that maybe we can think of? And I would say, yes, there are a lot of things we can learn from them in terms of strategy and structure and how they do things and so on and so forth. But the thing, so the, but the reason why I brought up the eternal ceiling, the eternal ceiling uh, is that it is explicitly contrary to what scripture teaches. Scripture teaches uh, that uh, uh, the, the scripture teaches uh, that when two when, when two are when two are joined together, no man can no man when God joins two together, no man can cast asunder, and they will remain together till death do they part. Yeah. So at so our covenant or our bond is 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 released from us upon death, the physical death. Yeah. So when the set, in fact, the in fact, G, in fact, Jesus was questioned something similar to this by the Sadducees. You know, he told he, he, he the Sadducees asked Jesus, "Hey, Jesus, suppose a woman marries a man, and then the husband dies. You know, <laughs> yeah. then the then she go, so she marries the brother, which is which is according to the law that what Moses gave. You marry the brother, but suppose the second brother dies, then he marries the third, then the third brother dies, and then he goes to the fourth. I think by the third, I surely by the third, uh, the woman should be arrested as a killer, huh? But then, my, <laughs> yeah. But, uh, but it goes on. So suppose seven husbands, and all of them die, and then finally she dies. On the day of judgment, the Sadducees ask, "Whose wife should w- would she be?" To which then Jesus says, "You fool! You need to know the word of God, know the power of it. For when we die, we will not." We'll no longer be joined together like on earth, but we'll be like the like the angels in heaven, in that we are no longer in covenant together. You see, so very clearly, very explicitly, Jesus already said against this eternal sin, and yet that is one of the main cruxes of uh, of the Mormon faith. In fact, it's central, uh, as as I as I pointed to earlier in, that, in doctrines and covenants one hundred and thirty. Why does God allow it if it can be read? Mm. Mm. Sorry, I don't understand the question, Gabby. Uh, uh, could, you, uh, could, you, could you please uh, elaborate on your question? Thanks, but why God allows it can be the Bible? Okay. I just don't understand as if people don't read the Bible. Why can how can they be so wrong about the, the things, you know? I mean I, I I just cannot understand why moments come about that they can be so I I, I don't I do not know how to explain it the when the Bible is there. Why people can be distorted in their thinking and all this? Okay. Okay. Thanks, Jyoti. Yeah. Uh, George, Tony, you wanna you wanna take a step at that first? Maybe mm. maybe King James Bible very hard to understand. <laughs> <laughs> uh, well, I think the this is Joseph is keen to start his own religion. So he doesn't want to be too constrained by knowing about the Bible. You know, he, he has his own belief and he wants to strike out on his own. So he makes up his own law, his own rules and doctrine. And I don't think he was trying to read the Bible to understand it and then slowly come up with something, an improvement on the Bible. I don't think his interest was there in the first place. He wanted to create a new religion, religion in his own mind, you know. I think at that time, I think polygamy must have been a star attraction for them. You know, they can have as many wives as they want. But I wonder why they now chose 
uh, not to have that anymore. I think they have taken away one of the most attractive uh, part of their religion. Mm. So I don't think they, they were studying the Bible and then trying to interpret the Bible as best they can and then they veered off tangent and they came up with this. No, I don't think they started doing that. He was only keen to start his own religion. Bible is only okay. something that they can use as a crux to say, oh, we are uh, trying to reform religion. And then they move on from there. Right. It's an excuse. I think when Islam was formed, they also said that they believe in Injil, they believe in Torah, and finally they yeah, believe Abur. in the prophets yeah, as well. They, yeah. they couldn't, bo couldn't bother about Injil, uh, Torah, but just on, concentrate on Quran, you see. So I think the same thing, and we can say the same for Catholic as well. You know, they, they also had the Bible. Why are they still believing that you must have a, 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 what we call work in order to, to gain salvation, you know? So the same thing happened, you know. All these people who follow this religion, they actually are being taught by their leaders to, to follow a certain way and interpret the Bible in a certain way. Mm. A few things to be said also. Number one is um, the evangelical faith. So we, so we as Christians, uh, we as gospel bearers, the Bible detects everything. So the Bible is essential to our faith. As Baptists especially, the Lordship of Jesus Christ and the, suprem and the supremacy and efficiency of Scripture for all matters of faith and reason. Yeah, so that is our front and center. Many, many cults and many sects, unfortunately, they will take the Bible instead of the focus point, they take it as the supporting document. So they so rather than going to the Bible and say, What does it what does God intend to teach us? They go to the Bible and say, Okay, which Bible verse supports my teaching? So that's dangerous, number one. Number two, um, we we have to continue to remember that this is an element of spiritual warfare. So let's say, for example, I take for let's say I take at face value that an angel appeared to appeared to Joseph Smith and had this revelation. The question then, therefore, is which angel is this? You know, I deposit. I I deposit. If I were to give uh, Joseph Smith uh, the benefit of the doubt, uh, I would say that he was visited by the by a demon or the devil, because this because this has eluded millions of people away from the gospel of Jesus Christ. Yeah, so that's the other thing. Uh, finally, uh, as what the as what brother Tony said, uh, but I I want to I want to look into it a little bit deeper. Um, things in the Mormon Church ends up becoming so well oiled and regimented that oftentimes they just do for the sake of doing without any references to the Bible. But it's also but that can also be saying said same to us as Christians. Um. Why do we sing the doxology in Pantai Baptist Church? Oh, we sang the doxology because, you know, the previous guys did it, the previous, previous guys did it, the previous, previous guys did it. Somebody started it and then we just carried on, you know. But if anyone were to ask why the doxology and why after, and why after the collection of offering. Uh, so we must have our reasons as to why we do that. Lah, you know? And why is the offering collected in Pantai Baptist Church uh, uh, after... Uh, uh, before yeah, uh, before the uh, why is offering collected be, before yeah. the pastoral prayer before the sermon, right? <laughs> yeah, because why? Because it is still a part of worship. It's an act of giving unto the Lord. That's one, and so we do the giving first before God then gives to us either by means of the ordinances when we take holy communion, and then the, and then we and then God hears our prayers by intercession through the pastoral prayer. And finally, God gives to us His word through the preacher. So there is a there is a transaction that is happening in our in our worship. Now, of course, transaction sounds very impersonal, huh? but bottom line is we are actually going back and forth with God. You know, so that's why. And the the and therefore the reason why we sing the doxology like it is our like it's our weekly anthem is because it ensures that our worship is rendered unto the Trinity of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. So we have these reasons. Mormons, unfortunately, there are many things that they do. Uh, uh, oftentimes, if they were to know the origin as to why they do it, they would stop, they would stop practicing it altogether. 
In fact, there is a growing community of Mormon leave, of people of former Mormon believers. Uh, and when they got into the history and when they got into the reasons why they practiced certain things, uh, it disillusioned them and they said that's why they left the Mormon church altogether. altogether. Okay, just now you mentioned about doctrines. I think there are three possible sources of doctrine. One is the doctrine of man, man, uh, you know, from man's own imagination. So there's a doctrine from man. Second one is doctrine from demons. You know, they 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 are they can masquerade as angels of light. So they can come and. Uh, so some discord among you or mislead you, deceive you, give you something that is similar to the truth, but with a little twist. Those are the doctrines of demons. Then, of course, the pure source would be doctrine from God himself. So we have to be very careful when we study religions. We must try to find out where they got their doctrines from, in which category they fall under. So if it's from the doctrine of man, then it should be very pure. There shouldn't be any contradiction, and we we can bet our lives on on those doctrines. But if it's from man, man's intellect is fallen, and he, he cannot reason very well. And there are definitely to be pitfalls to be found. You know, in the later part, doctrines of demons. You will know they will lead you astray. They will take you away from Christ. There's a spirit of the Antichrist. So these are the three different sources of uh, doctrines mm. to differentiate between them. A couple of other questions here. Any questions yeah. today? Huh? <laughs> Maybe quite faster can give him some lessons. <laughs> sure. Uh, but, I mean, I told this story before, but I'll tell it again, and I'll probably tell it again next week. Um, I've been blacklisted by the Mormon Missionary Movement. Uh, well, at least, uh, like when I was in FBC Subang, I would pick up Mormon missionary, Mormon kids, Mormon missionaries, because they're basically kids. They're 18, 19, 20 years old, college students. You know, so I would reach out to them, befriend them, get them a drink, and after they give me their spiel of, uh, of, their, of their Mormon faith belief, uh, I would then ask very basic things, you know. Um, so, have you gone to college yet? Where do you think? Where do you think? Where, where do you think of going? Uh, what? Uh, what? What do you want to be when you go, when you when you're in the working world? Do, what's your career line? You know. Uh, are, are you pressured to be married? Are you pressured to get married? Do you have a girlfriend waiting for you back at home? And then this helps breaks down the the mold, and then it speaks into their hearts. You see. And apparently it's so effective that quite a number of them end up having to go home straight because, <laughs> because they end up being very anxious about anxious about home and uh and they end up being quite shaken about their faith. Uh so what ended up happening is that they they identified my car and that time I drove a black Pro Duo Alza. Uh and so they say, Oh, you see a black Pro Duo Alza with the numbers five nine zero three, don't go near him, don't get into his car, run. You know? Uh, so I switched cars. <laughs> yeah, then I got a pickup. Then, then I got a, a, a an SUV, uh, you know, and five seven five seven. And I end up picking up two, three more, and that kept on going. But uh, in the end, I end up being blacklisted even from that, you know. So, uh, I just got another. I got. I have a different car from before now. So I have, but I haven't tested that yet. Let's see how it goes, lah. Okay. A question to for Doctor Tony, right? There was one there. Uh, Hmm. You mentioned all followers of Christ will end up in one place of God. What about rewards that mentioned in the scripture? Were these rewarded saints in different class with God? Okay. okay. A lot of people Come. would think... That, Come on, dispensationalists. <laughs> yeah, you, you think, Explain uh, yourself. <laughs> uh, some people think, wow, if you have done well, God will give you a lot of rewards. But if you read the book of Revelations carefully... All those people with crowns, what do they do with the crowns? Crown of life, crown of righteousness, crown of uh, salvation, so many other crowns. Eh? So they lay them at the foot of the cross, yeah. at the foot of the throne of God. So <laughs> even the elders cast their crowns before God. You know? So yeah. we, 
I think when we are up there, we will never feel that we deserve all that. It's all by the grace of God. We don't deserve any single thing. Everything that we have, that He has rewarded us with, belongs to Him solely and uh, completely. And we will give it all back as a form of service. So it doesn't mean that if we, we have done very well, we have served Him well, we get a huge mention, bigger than uh, Bill Gates mentioned. And those who just slip through will get a, a storeroom to stay in. <laughs> I think that's faulty thinking, you know, because even in a parable, Jesus is talking about those people, parable of the talent, those who did well, five talents, they came out with another five, the other two, got back another two, then the one without doing anything, he was cast out, and then that one talent was given to the one with the ten. With ten. Mm. Yeah. So here, you see, you have been faithful in a little. Much will be given to you. So in that sense, the reward will be in heaven. I don't think we'll be sitting on clouds forever and ever play the harp and sing. All day long. We have a lot of things to do. You know, God has got mm. marvelous plans that our puny mind will never be able to imagine or even fathom. You know, even if you were to tell us now, we will be overwhelmed completely. So whatever we have, we, we he will reward us with more. If we have done well here, serving him in certain areas, he will give us more responsibility. So I think as uh, when we are up there, we will never be tired. We will be having a, a resurrected body. So we can do a lot more. And I think the enjoyment of heaven will be in proportion to how much we are given to do. So Jesus said, you have been faithful a little, I'll give you more. Yeah. So I think Finally, the rewards will be in terms of the, the, the responsibilities that God will give to us so that we will find much more fulfillment when we have a lot of things to do and uh, we are given responsibilities and God will continue to bless us because he will enable us to do all those perfectly. Mm. Just like you know, a concert pianist here, they try to get it perfect, but when they are up there, they are so, so good. They, are, they, they will never make any mistakes, so they will be performing, you know, before the heavenly choir. Mm. And that will give them the richest kind of, uh, you know, experience. So to me, it's not in terms of the biggest house or giving gold. What is the point of gold? The streets of heaven will be paved with gold. And all the walls will be having all this... Uh, what they get precious stones, yeah. So we yeah. don't need anything. Why do we need anything? We don't need money. Yeah. Which is why I, f so I feel for us, yeah by enriching yeah. our lives there. Which is why I feel for preachers. Uh, we have to be careful about illustrations, lah. Sometimes, mm -hmm. yeah. I think that one of the more famous uh, errors of illustrations that I've heard on the pulpit uh, was always the story of the of the preacher and the bus driver. The preacher mm. goes to heaven and he gets a little house. Uh, the bus driver gets a mansion, yeah. you know. And then when when pre preacher asks God, God, why am I given a small house? But the bus driver, you know, gets mm. a mansion. Then God says, Oh, preacher, because when you preach, everybody falls asleep. But when yeah. the bus driver drives, everybody prays. <laughs> everybody you prays. Know? So yeah. that, yeah. So that's a fault. So that's a faulty illustration. Yeah. And uh, that's and I I give thanks to God that uh, so far I have not heard this illustration by that Baptist church lah for anything alike. Because it's important for us to give an accurate description of, of of the of the final hope we have in Jesus Christ beyond the veil, right? Mm -hmm. So, yeah, uh, keep faithful, keep faithful in, in preaching and especially in describing uh, the great the grace and eternal reward of, of uh, in Jesus Christ. With that, wow, it's nine forty. Uh, thank you all so much for your <laughs> patience. Shot. <laughs> yeah, dude. Do join us next week as we get as we go into uh, two. as you go to moment part two and we will and we will be talking especially about in how we can engage or how we can uh, uh how we can practically engage and be aware of the of the movements of the modern church and that will should make us to be better representatives for the uh, for the for, for the gospel for the gospel in the Klang Valley. Yeah. So do join us for next week. We'll get into the nitty-gritties as to how we how we ought and how we, we should start thinking of doing things. Yeah.
I will start with some broad ones and I hope that through the Q&A, we can start ironing out as to what are some things that we as the local that the local church, local representatives of the gospel and PBC, how can we counter uh, uh, actions like uh, actions like this is being done by the modern church? Yeah. So thank you all so much. Uh, may I invite uh, Brother Huisu, if you're still here, could you join? Could you yeah. close this time okay. in prayer for us?